Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on exec- on executive directors and uh, nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Unoduce Multimedia, and I'd like to welcome uh, a special guest here, Alex Brace, the executive director of Small Talk Child Advocacy Center. Um, Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks, Paul. Happy to be here. Oh, it's it's awesome. I know that we've we've uh, tried a couple times to get you on the show. We're finally here. This is awesome. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, I'm super excited. It should be great. Yeah. Um, now the name of the show is obviously Mission Control. So how we want to start with start this is with your mission. What is the mission of Small Talk? Yeah. So our mission is uh, to provide hope, healing, and justice to children who have been impacted by uh, child sexual and physical abuse. Uh, so anytime that that happens in Ingham or Eaton County, so those children can come to our center um, and be provided with free healing services, which include forensic interviews, counseling, advocacy. Uh, we do some prevention work as well. Um, so yeah, we're really trying to kind of heal the trauma that uh, often goes unseen in, in our community and many other communities across the world, really. It's really important work that you're doing. How did you get into this area of counseling and all that other stuff that, that you do on a regular basis today? How did you, what sparked your interest in, in getting into this world? Yeah, that's a great, I love answering this question because it's just, a, it's a really funny story to me. So uh, I'm a Lansing local, so I, I grew up in Lansing. I graduated from Sexton High School in 2004. Um, so my junior year, I had a, um, I got put into a psychology class, uh, AP psych class um, that I did not want to be in. So I didn't have any friends in that class. Um, I was, I tried several times to get out of it. Like one day I went down to the counselor's office and um, I tried to uh, switch my classes and like the computers were down. So I had to like suffer for another couple of days. And then the next day, like my counselor wasn't there. So I couldn't switch to class. So at a certain point I just became helpless. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stick around in this class. And um I'll, I'll never forget this is one of my favorite teachers, Mrs. Hubbard, who I think is still at Sexton. I'm not entirely sure, but um, she approached me after a class one day and was like, you know, I heard you were trying to get out of my class. And I was like, yeah, I, I was. <laughs> and uh, she was like, well, I'm really glad you didn't. Like, I'm really glad that you stayed. Um, and that like sort of like welcoming environment was really cool because then it made me feel like safe in that environment, especially when I didn't have any friends. And this was something that I had really never considered as like a career path or even a class that I would be interested in. Um, but then I fell in love with it. I think a lot of it was her teaching style and um, it was stuff that I was interested in, but I didn't know I was interested in it um, or I didn't have like a name to put to it. So um that, that kind of like sent me on my journey i went to msu um and did my undergrad in psych i was one of those rare students who didn't switch their major they declared it you know first day at orientation and, and never changed and um then realized you know about halfway through my undergrad career that if i want to you know be working with kids and um you know, helping to do, you know, some of the healing work that I was hoping to do, um, that I'd need to go to grad school. So I ended up going to MSU uh, and getting a counseling degree there as well. And then kind of moved on to, uh, after I finished my uh, graduate degree, um, I moved to Wisconsin for a little bit um, and did some work there with adults with uh, severe and persistent mental illness. Um, that was a really difficult job. Um, and it was something that, you know, I had always wanted to work with children. Um, and kind of helping them heal from whatever they needed to heal from. Um, and was lucky enough to find a, a job posting a couple, you know, like a year after I graduated um, for a place that was not called Small Talk at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it would get me back home and I'd get to see my mom more often and um, be able to uh, do some work directly with kids and therapy work. And then um, you know, from there, I, I stayed at Small Talk. I've been there since it was um, since its inception in 2011, um, and then became 
the executive director in 2015, I think. So I'm going on nine years in that role now. But it's been, it's difficult to say that it's like really great work because it's not something that I think any of us are really want to have to be doing. I think, you, I mean, I'm sure with many of the guests that you've had on Paul, they probably feel very similar. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really want to be doing this kind of work, but I think as long as it continues to be a problem, like I'm really, really grateful that we have an organization like this in our community that can have the kind of impact that it does. It's, it is amazing. It's a very gratifying work. I'm going to back up on a couple things that you were talking about. First of all, um, what what was it about? Or let let's go back to you. You mentioned that you were in Wisconsin for a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, working with more like more adults at that mm -hmm. time. And you said it was really difficult. What was difficult? I think what was really challenging about that was. Um, sometimes the success, the way that you kind of uh, identify success is a little bit different. Um, I think in a, especially in this, maybe in the specific setting that I was in. So um, when we were doing a lot of more case management pieces of it. So it's a lot of like making sure that our clients are taking their meds and that they're getting to their appointments. And there's a lot less, uh, at least in the environment I was in, a lot less sort of goal setting. And it was really more about stabilization not necessarily about like helping people to thrive. Um, and I think for, you know, a young, uh, you know, idealistic uh, therapist at the time, oh, I like to think I'm still a bit idealistic, but um, I haven't lost all of that. But I think like it was really difficult because it was like the way that I would sort of judge success uh, for myself as a, as a therapist, as a professional, was very different from organizationally or even with our clients, how they would judge success. And I think when those things didn't mesh or weren't in alignment, I think just personally for me, that was really difficult. I think there are some people that are made to really do that work and it's very, very important work. I think it was one of those lessons that I think I had to learn about. These are the things that I, um, I don't want to do um, or that I don't feel like is the best use of my sort of skill set. Um, as a professional, as a therapist. All right. And then you also mentioned that your, your desire in this field was to work with kids, with yeah. children. What, 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 where does that stem from? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's a lot of different places. I grew up, um, you know, without a dad. So I think there are things like in my sort of psyche that I'm like, I want to be able to, to create, um, a good like adult child um you know like working relationship um i think that that's really valuable um i also think kids there's just so much to be like they're fun to work with i think there is like a level of like optimism that they just organically have mm -hmm. that i think is really um like inspiring for me to continue to do the work. I think it is like, you know, to just kind of like, they don't get jaded. Like we as adults do sometimes, I think, and there's just so much room for growth too, which I think is one of the like coolest things about kids is like when you are working with them therapeutically, you get to see that they make these little like incremental changes that they don't even realize. Like there was a, um, there was a kid that I was working with the other day um, who struggles with like some social anxiety and um, mentioned that they went to a concert a couple of weeks ago. And uh, through some of the conversations we had, she was like, you know, what? I, I decided I was just going to give compliments to like three different people. And she was like, it was really scary. And I did it. And it felt great. And she kind of diminished it and was like, you know, it wasn't really like it was all like the same kind of person. And it was all spaces where I felt really comfortable. But we really had to talk through that and be like, you know, that was actually like a bit like, let's give that the credit it deserves. Um, and I think being, you know, again, being able to be part of like inspiration for inspiring that next generation of young people um, who are going to do, you know, really great work, What you know, whether it's this kind of work or whatever it is they're going to do, that they're going to live, you know, happy, help, healthy lives. Um, and to be a part of that um, is the best feeling in the world. 
I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, it's just interesting to me because I feel like, like you said, the, the youth, the kids don't get jaded, um, but they do listen, mm-hmm. and that, you know, and they, they make these, they make these observations and they know how to pull them in or out. It's just odd. Yeah, you know better than I do, but it's just, it's just interesting to me that you, you phrased it like that. Cause I never really thought about it in that, in that sense of, yeah, as adults, we get jaded every other day, maybe sometimes every other hour, depending yeah. on what we've decided to look at at that yeah. point in time. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting viewpoint. So yeah. how did you hear about small talk when you came back? Uh, how did they come yeah. across your um, Well, I, I had been looking for um, a new job and I was looking back mm-hmm. in Michigan and there were a couple of things that I had, I think I just found it like on a, a job board somewhere. And it was, so at the time, um, our center that's based here in Ingham County um, was being sort of mentored by uh, the Shiawassee County Advocacy Center. Um, so I think it's the posting was something about Shiawassee mm. Advocacy Center or something like that. I have family that lives in Shiawassee County. So I was like, all right, well, that and it's not super far from Lansing. I was like, that could be, you know, that could be a good transition back to to Michigan. And then once I, um, you know, got back and, and did the interview, um, you know, found out a little bit more about the position that would be located in Lansing. And, um, I would be sort of the only employee that's actually like in the Lansing area. Um, so that was kind of a unique experience, but it was the kind of situation where I would get to work with kids, which was, was something that I was really passionate about, or I am still passionate about, and, um, you know, being able to come back to Michigan. So it kind of ticked all my boxes. And, right. um, you know, luckily I, I had a good interview and they uh, been stuck with me ever since. So, um <laughs> Yeah, it's been a it's been a really great joy. I had no idea what a um, children's advocacy center was um, before applying for this position either, um, and I think it's it that experience that I had has kind of like spurred me to make sure that everybody knows what a children's advocacy center is because I think it is one of those like hidden gems in like not only our community certainly but um, in communities across the country that there are these coordinated efforts between law enforcement and prosecutors and medical professionals and therapists and forensic interviewers who are doing this really amazing work sort of in the background um, for people that really need it. Um, You know, we run the kind of nonprofit where nobody wants to really come here. Um, This is not a service that anybody really wants to use. Um, But I think, you know, when we look at the, you know, the epidemic of child abuse, it is something that impacts so many different people. And even if you're not, you don't feel like maybe you're directly impacted, there's very likely a person in your life, whether it's a child or an adult who has experienced it, who has been through it. Um, And this is not something that we can just turn a blind eye to. So I think like it's, um, you know, being able to see that as a, um, you know, that this is a really essential resource and something that the, the world should know about. Um, you know, that's why opportunities like this are so awesome to be able to just spread the word about what it is that we do and why it's so important. Absolutely. And so you find small talk, you're there for a little bit, and then you transition to being executive director. How was that? How was that transition? Yeah. I mean, it was tough. I think like they definitely don't teach you how to be an executive director in like therapy school is what I used to always, I still say that sometimes. And like, they didn't really, you know, um, you know, uh, train me to, to have some of the same skill sets that I need to have in the executive director role. Um, so I think there was definitely a learning curve. I think being able to, um, you know, having to manage people, I think, is always, uh, you know, a challenge. I think we've been really lucky that we have great staff and a great team here. But, um, you know, teams are teams and things come up and you have to manage it. And, you know, when you're the person who everybody's kind of looking to for answers, um, you know, in a one on one situation with like a client, like that's the space that I always felt super comfortable in um, mm-hmm. because I was just that's what I knew. Um you know, but then having to to navigate those different kind of relationships, that is more of a challenge. Um, but I think there are things that I really like about the administrative part of it. I think there is um, some more with certain things, some more immediate gratification, too. 
Um, so, you know, being able to say like, I wrote this grant and it's finished and it's submitted as opposed to like, I'm working with this kid on their goals and it could take like two years for us to, mm. to get there. Um, so I, you know, I think I've had, I've been really lucky that I've had a lot of great mentors, um, you know, in, in leadership, especially throughout my career. Um, you know, one of our, our former board chair, Annie Harrison, um, who works for the uh, Ingham County Sheriff's Office has been a really great mentor for me. And, um, you know, somebody who's been really, really helpful in my, my kind of growth and evolution as a, as a leader here. Um, and then a lot of other people in the, like the advocacy center world um, who I can always reach out to for advice. And it's really nice to have this like network of, of individuals who are really supportive of each other understand. Cause I think sometimes being executive director too, and I'm, I'm sure you've had this conversation with other EDs that you've talked to is it is kind of a lonely existence. You know, you're the only one at your organization who has the role that you have. There is no sort of shared responsibility with a lot of these things. So sometimes it can feel like a really isolating um, job um, and really isolating work. Um, but I think being able to, as we've kind of grown, you know, we've built out sort of like a leadership structure, which I think has been like a huge, huge positive change um, for us as an organization. Um, and just for me personally, the, to have some different levels of leadership um, within the organization rather than having a an org chart that's just like me and then everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, to have some stratified leadership, I think, is really huge. And it's really cool to just see other people kind of step into those roles and take on some of that responsibility, too. Um, I think, like, I love the idea of just mentorship in general. And, like, I think it's really important as leaders to not keep all that information for yourself. Like I do feel a responsibility to kind of give it back to others and make sure that they feel empowered and, and have some ownership over their careers and their, their jobs and the work that they do. Um, and I think when you have people that you trust that you work with, um, you know, it's really easy to do that. Um, you know, and I think that that's something that took me some time to to learn and really get comfortable with, um, to be able to say, I think especially being sort of like the person that has been here the longest it's like the institutional knowledge that I like, I have all of it. Mm -hmm. I've done almost every job here. Um, so I get it. Um, but I know for us to be a sustainable organization long term, that can't all just sit with me. It's mm -hmm. got to be with other people within the organization. And, um, you know, like I said, we're at a really, really awesome place right now with some really fantastic individuals who are doing really, really great work that, um, I'm super proud to work with every day. So how would you describe your leadership style? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I am pretty, I like to, I jokingly would say like Michael Scott from the office. I love the office, <laughs> um, but I'm still employed. I don't think Michael in the real world would be still employed. So um I think maybe maybe Michael Scott in his best moments um, <laughs> it would be maybe be one way I would describe it. But um, I think I'm pretty democratic. Um, I think I really uh, I really really value collaboration. Um, I think I love the I don't remember who said it, but I remember there was some quote about somebody. I think it was like a GM of like a basketball team or something that was like, I really like the idea of like hiring people who are smarter than me, and I think I really like to have, um, you know, that when we have problems or we have things that we need to figure out um, with the understanding that I alone can't be the, um, like I have to be the, the person who makes the final decision, um, but I also don't wanna make those decisions in isolation either. I really want to, you know, I have people here, you know, all the staff that we have, I really value their opinions and I think they have really good ideas and I think it would be foolish of me to not bring them in at certain at points that it's appropriate um, to be able to consult with them and get their opinions and thoughts. I think a lot of decisions that have um, have come up have been made through that collaborative sort of conversation. So I think like this idea of like a hive mind of all of us working together to build solutions, I think is really, really valuable. So that's something that I think I really like to push is a lot of collaboration just within the organization. Like, let's not make these decisions in isolation. Let's talk through it. Let's have some conversations. Um, you know, I think I like to, I like to have an office that's really joyful. 
too. I think like, especially with the kind of work that we're doing, mm -hmm. um, it would be really miserable for us to be really dour all the time and um, be upset. And so, like that could, that should be our default because of the work that we do. It should be very easy for us to go right into that. Um, you know, this work is really difficult and then having to kind of take it home with us and have it impact our personal lives and things like that. Um, and I don't want to have that kind of office. I want to have a joyful, upbeat office that's hopeful, um, you know, that sees, you know, these horrible situations that we're, you know, exposed to every day um, as opportunities for healing for these kids. Um, we had a board member who recently was saying like, you know, small talk is the best part of maybe the worst day of somebody's life or one of the worst days of somebody's life. So if we can, you know, kind of have that same mentality of like, yes, this really sucks. And, you know, we have to kind of carry a lot of this vicarious and secondary trauma with us. Um, you know, we should be, we should find the joy in the work that we do. Um, so I think like really creating that kind of positive work environment, again, especially with the kind of work that we do, I think is absolutely critical. I know like I have, I have really great, I am usually, uh, this is my sort of weakness, I think as a director, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a lot of stuff home with me. Um, and I will have, um, I think we're at a really good place now where I have a lot of staff who will kind of call me out on it. Like sometimes if I'm going away for a weekend or something, and um i've got my backpack on they'll be like is your computer in your backpack you should probably just take it back to your office and i'm like you know what you're right so i think like that kind of like level of camaraderie and like that we're just looking out for each other um i think is super super valuable um so yeah hopefully that answered your question no it did and uh, it just brings me to a new one uh through what you're saying with what you, I mean, everything that you just mentioned about what you approach on a daily basis, what the whole organization stands for and, and does for the community and for the people that you serve, how difficult it is, is it to hire in or hire people to to do this because you have to be completely transparent like all mm -hmm. right this is going to be some heavy stuff you may not have been shown or taught this through the schooling you've done mm -hmm. this is real now this is the real world how do you how do you approach bringing on new team members with that with that uh hanging over you that's that's a really good question i've never been asked that question before that's a great question um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of times we're really upfront during the interview process and just letting people like that is a standard interview question that we ask is that, you know, you know, through your work here, you're going to be exposed to some things that are really difficult to hear. Um, and I think we want to be like really upfront and honest about exactly what those kind of things are, because I think there's, you can have this perception, I think, of what kind of things we're going to be talking about on a daily basis, but that is that does not do justice to the actual reality of the work that we're doing. So we try and be as open and honest with that as, as possible and letting people know that, um, you know, it, like, I think it's really important when I look at somebody who's um, going to really do well here, it's about that person really, even during that interview, giving an honest answer too. So if there's somebody who's gonna be like, yeah, that is probably gonna be really difficult for me sometimes. And um, and then talking about sort of like, you know, what maybe are some things that you do, you know, when you do encounter hard things in the workplace, what are some things that you do to help yourself cope essentially? Uh, Cause that's what we all have to do, um, you know, with this work. Um, so I think that piece of it is really key. I think we have a really, really great onboarding um, program as well. So when we do bring new staff to the fold, they are able to, um, you know, we're doing a lot of checking in with them, making sure that they feel safe, they feel comfortable, um, you know, that if they do have things that are difficult, that they have opportunities for supervision, um, 
that it's not even maybe only their direct supervisor that they can come talk to. Like if their direct supervisor isn't here, creating an environment where it's like all of our doors are open, you can come talk to any of us at any time. We're happy to do that. And I think it's also really critical for us. We're hiring for positions that are not doing the direct programming work either. Like when we're talking about like our office manager or our development director, like making sure that we're having conversations with them too, because it's not just a a verbal thing that happens. Sometimes it's a mood, you know, the experience in the office, or you know, when we have a, a case that doesn't go well, or we have a kid that's really struggling, and you know, it's really up, incumbent upon us as a group to you know rally for that person. Um, you know, and that as an extension of that for that client too, to make sure that they know that they have the support that, that they need because we can't we can't do our best work, you know, when we're at fifty percent, when we're burnt out and stressed. Um, you know, we can only we can only give from our overflow really. That's what we that's what we should be trying to do. Um, and that can be, I mean, with the kind of work that we do, that's a huge challenge. <laughs> we, we can't always achieve that, but I think that's always what we're shooting for. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's, that's, those are some tough situations that you have to face on a daily basis. So going back to, uh, when you're leaving the office mm -hmm. with your backpack mm -hmm. about to go away for a weekend and you're, yeah. Your employee says, no, maybe you should leave the backpack. Okay. Yeah. Let's say you left the backpack. Yeah. You leave the office. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing to unwind, to get away, to relax? What do you do? Yeah. Um, well, I love movies. That's usually where you'll find me. If I take like a Friday off, I'm usually like at the movie theater at like noon watch a movie so that that is one of that is my absolute that's like my safe space i love going to the movies that is that brings me so much joy um you know i have a i have family at home too so i have a wife and daughter um so being able to spend time with them is you know brings me you know just as much joy as going to the movies <laughs> and be bad it was the opposite <laughs> uh, but yes, no, I love spending time with them. Um, you know, I think especially being a dad, it brings a lot of perspective into the work that I do now. And I think it makes me just super, super grateful um, and very kind of intentional about creating a really like safe environment. And I think like maybe even, you know, just as important is um, being able to model some of that like healthy coping for her too, um, because I don't want her to, to see her dad as this, you know, workaholic who like mm. just came home and you know was doing work for eight hours and then did work for five more hours you know mm. while and when there could have been time that we're spending together so um you know i think being able to spend time with them is a real um you know kind of keeps me uh on the right path i think in a lot of ways um i like to write too um that's something that i really enjoy um you know, I, like I'll go to the gym, um, being able to go like bike rides is something that I really like to do. I live just off the river trail. Um, so being able to go and take like a really long bike ride, you know, for a few miles is a really great way to kind of clear my head and, um, you know, just kind of being out in nature and being able to see the sights and it's not, you know, it's all the same path, but it's always different every time. Um, <laughs> and I love it. I think it's great. So, uh, those are a few things I like to do. Yeah. Well, I know that I could probably talk to you for another hour about your journey and the things that, that we've been talking about, but man, we have to close it out. So what is the best way for people to reach you if they have any more questions about you or small talk, anything along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, small talk, you can visit us at uh, smalltalkcac.org. Um, we are also on uh, Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook uh, at SmalltalkCAC. Uh, you can reach me personally. My email is abrace, A-B-R-A-C-E, at smalltalkcac.org. Um, but always happy to, to connect and, and share, you know, whether it's about my story, about small talk. Um, you know, again, I feel like this is, uh, you know, other than being like a husband and a father, this is the most important thing I'll ever do with my time on this earth mm. and um you know i am 
fully committed to making sure that this is something that uh, that exists be beyond me and, you know, for as long as it needs to. Hopefully, you know, we'll get to a space where we can close our doors and we don't need uh, CACs. We don't need, um, you know, child abuse therapists anymore. But um, until that day comes, you know, I, I want to make sure that we have everything that we need to make sure that we can meet the need of the people in our community. That's amazing. Well, thank you again, Alex, for taking some time and telling us about your story and listen to that journey. And, you know, you're right. It's, it's a difficult, difficult world that you are in on a daily basis, but we're so glad that you've chosen to, to do this path. It's awesome. Thank you again for being on this. Thanks.